heating systems session one components required for boiler interlock so the key objectives for this part of the session i want you all to be able to list the items required for boiler interlock and describe the purpose of each what what do they do why why are they required and also explain how certain controls can prevent frost damage to the pipework or components like the boiler so firstly what is boiler interlock it isn't actually a, any one thing it's it's a number of things coming together all wired up together that will turn the system on or off in an efficient way based on the customer's time and temperature preferences it's a requirement of building regulations part l and it's described in the building services compliance guide depending on the boiler type via a, a combi boiler or, or a systems boiler there might be slightly different requirements and there also might be slightly different requirements based on the fuel that the boiler uses but we're going to look uh, mainly at natural gas boilers the requirements for natural gas oils almost exactly the same as well um okay so we're going to look at this now boiler interlock there's lots of components required to make up boiler interlock we should have thermostatic radiator valves to control the temperature of each individual radiator based on the room temperature cylinder stat if a cylinder's fitted the cylinder thermostat to turn the the cylinder off when it reaches an appropriate temperature a room thermostat to turn off the heating system when the room reaches an appropriate temperature a programmer to con to control when these circuits will be be open a uh, pump to circulate the water and motorized valves there's a couple of different types of motorized valves we're going to look at today um, but motorized valves to to sort of switch the the water between these circuits or allow the water to flow to both of them depending on the, the requirements of the programmer and and the thermostats for the system to be considered as as having boiler interlock it must be wired up correctly we're going to learn about that level three we're going to kind of talk talk it through briefly a bit later on in this part of the session but if you do level three it's something we'd actually physically do in the in the, in the practical and all of the connections would be connected up together in something called a wiring center so all of our cables would come back to a, a, a certain point uh, in, the, in the wiring center where they'd all be sort of wired up and the appropriate connections would be made between each part to make sure that things fire up in the right order in terms of the electrical supply and um, the electrical supply is is supplied to heating system through a fuse switch bar so if you were to work on any of the components, be it the pump, the motorised valve, anything like that, you should switch it off at the fuse, uh, switch bar, remove the fuse, um, test the tester, test the circuit, test the tester again, you know, all that safe isolation procedure um, stuff that we talked about previously. Um, so you carry out safe isolation procedure and isolate it at the fuse switch bar. Okay, it'd be fitted with a three amp fuse, the heating circuit, and like, yeah, it's the best place to isolate it. Not really. Um, boilers, um, both gas and oil, oil boilers should have an efficiency of at least 88%. And that actually uh, means they fall into Sedbuck, uh, the Sedbuck A rated category. Um, and Sedbuck stands for seasonal efficiency of domestic boilers in the UK. Time control. The minimum uh, time control is a programmer apart from a combi boiler combi boilers can have a time clock but everything else um, must have a programmer and this controls when the heating will be on when the hot water uh, circuits will be on okay it's actually the recommended uh, best practice now is a programmable room stat 
This actually allows you not only to set when the heating is going to be on, but also allows you to set different temperatures for different parts of the day. So if, for example, you know that you go out at, um, say, 8 o'clock in the morning every morning, you could actually set it to the temperature to drop at 7.30 to, I don't know, say 17 degrees um, as a drop back temperature. And then sort of, you know, you're always back at 6 o'clock every evening, so you set it at half past five to come back on to start taking it back up towards a more comfortable living temperature of, say, around 20 degrees. Um, whereas a programmer will, will literally just have the system on or or off uh, in line with the, the temperature that you've got your room stat set. So say, for example, you've got your room stat set, set at 21, um, then as soon as the heating comes on, it'll be striving to get up to 21. As soon as it goes off, it won't have a, a drop back temperature. It'll just be off. And if it's really cold outside, that temperature could potentially drop to quite a cold uh, level, which means it's got to heat up uh, work a bit harder to heat up when when you come back. But yeah, um, minimum minimum uh, time control is a programmer recommended as a programmable room stat. Temperature controls, um, these are cylinder stats or room stats. They are thermostatically controlled switches. They'll switch the system on or off, allow the electricity to flow through. Um, depending on the temperature. If it's not been satisfied yet, for example, if you've got it set to 20 and the temperature is 18 degrees, then the switch inside will be will be closed. The, the electricity can flow through it to the, to the pump and the, and the boiler. Uh, and then once it becomes satisfied, this, the switch will open and um, there will be no electricity allowed to flow, which means it will switch off these circuits. So yeah, uh, the required temperature controls could differ depending on the boiler type. Um, obviously a combination boiler would, wouldn't require a cylinder start because it provides instantaneous hot water. If it does have a cylinder, make sure it's got a cylinder start on the cylinder as well as the room start in the living area. Uh, the room start should be positioned one and a half meters off the ground. Um, away from any sources of heat and all of the radi all of the radiators in every other room apart from the room with the room start in should be fitted with thermostatic radiator valves and this will allow sort of individualized control of the temperature in each room you don't fit them in the room with the room start because you don't want the temperature to be too easily adjusted at the radiators in that room because it could potentially lead to the room start calling out for heat when actually the rest of the, the house is warm enough. It just make sure that the room with the room start is heats up appropriately and isn't affected by, by anything else, essentially by any other valves. Cylinder stats, we should already know a lot about this. We've talked about it in hot water. Be set at 60, minimum is 60, maximum is 65. Should be in direct contact with the cylinder, um, positioned a third of the up from the base of the cylinder, etc. etc. Okay. Uh, motorized valves, we're going to look at now. Motorized valves can be used to zone the heating and hot water system. There's two port motorized valves, like this one here. You can see it's got one in and one out. And there's three port motorized valves, which has got one in and two outs. Um, you can use, you generally would use the two port motorized valves, which would be two or more two port motorized valves on larger systems over 150 meters squared. Whereas for smaller systems, you could use a three port valve. A three port valve, you have your, your common flow in here. Um, and the B uh, one would normally go off to the, the hot water because and the A one uh, would normally go off to the heating. Um, yeah, there's a synchron motor in the motorized valve, which can be replaced. Sometimes the, the motors can, can wear out over time. Sometimes the valves can get a bit sticky. You can actually move this 
part here manually um, on in the motorised valves to, to allow the water to flow if, if there, a fault has, has occurred with the system, just in the interim until it gets fixed. You can actually see on the inside of the valve there's a ball um, and that ball moves from side to side um, to allow the water to flow either to one circuit or the other. If it's a mid-position valve, a mid-position three-port valve, then it can actually flow to both circuits at the same time, depending on, on how the circuits set essentially what's calling out for heat. Interestingly, um, as the ball moves, it actually will open or close a micro switch, um, which allows the electricity to flow through the boiler and the pump and to switch them both on. And we're going to look at that, kind of how that works in a second. Excuse me. If the boiler and pump uh, don't switch off, it might be a fault with the micro switch in the motorised valve. Um, as I've said, two port motorised valves are normally used on larger properties, heating circuits bigger than 150 metres squared, um, because they can easily zone multiple areas. You can see on here we've got one, two, three, four two port valves. All of these potentially could be going off to different zones. One could be going off to the hot water cylinder, um, and, and these other ones could be going off to, to different zones, different floors of the property potentially. So three port motorised valves, um, they can be used to zone heating and hot water only, and they'll generally be used on smaller circuits, circuits smaller than 150 metres squared. Okay, uh, the middle port, port AB, is generally what we where we can uh, connect the, the common flow, the flow from the pump, the flow from the boiler, um, and then A normally goes off to the heating side, B normally goes off to the hot water side. Um, obviously, it's, it's going to go around the, the coil and, and back. It's going to be kept separately from the water in the cylinder. But the way I, I, I kind of remember this is I think B is for bath. So the B goes off to the hot water side, the bath, um, and A goes off to the heating. Nice easy way to remember. But the good thing with a mid-position motorised valve, it can flow to both at the same time, whereas um, with a diverter valve, uh, the, you can get sort of diverter valves which would only sort of allow the water to flow to one or the other. Generally speaking, diverter valves will always prioritise the hot water side over the heating. So they'll be, be wired up. Don't fit diverter valves anymore, but it's worth being aware of, of that. Okay. Uh, pumps pumps uh, are used to circulate the water in the system. Circulating pumps uh, look like this. They should always have a means of isolation fitted on each side. They should These would be full bore and the connections you'd either have, there's like a fibre washer in here, but you could also potentially use rubber washers to keep it watertight. And the reason that we have to have these valves fitted so close to it is to make them easy to maintain. You know, if you need to work on the, replace the pump, you don't need to drain down the whole system. You just switch the valve off here, switch the valve off here. But loosen it up here, loosen it up here. You can replace the pump straight straight up or carry maintenance and or whatnot. And then pop it back, back in and it's jobs again, you know, rather than having to drain the whole system to work on one component. We're going to look at where to position the pump uh, in next week's session and um, yeah but what we are going to do very briefly now is to, is to look at the, the wiring that this is the wiring is essentially what makes up boiler interlock and you can see we've got a few switch spur here um, 230 volts coming in so this is going to be what we would describe as the permanent live and we have a permanent live connected to to just a couple of, of things we can actually see we've got a permanent live connected into the boiler here We've got a permanent live going into this is actually a, a programmable room stat this this one um going into the the programmable room stat here and we have a permanent live going off to the motorized valve to the heating and also motorized valve for the hot water but you can see that where this permanent live connects in here it's actually on the downside of a switch 
So the electricity will only be able to flow through this when when this motor valve opens. So if we follow the electricity in, we can see it coming in here, going off to the the programmer or the programmable room start in this case. So when when this is calling out for heat at the appropriate time, then the electricity can then flow through here through number four, comes into to number five in a wiring centre, comes back out to a motorised valve, that would cause the motorised valve to open. That switch will, will then go to the closed position and electricity can flow through a permanent live into uh, uh, this orange wire here, which comes all the way through to here, which connects into the boiler, connects into the pump, causes the pump to start, to the boiler to fire up. And this valve will already have opened and, and the water will then be allowed to, to sort of flow through that valve until until the status is satisfied. Essentially, then it will sort of switch it off, uh, switch off the motorised valve, that will close, will open up the switch. There'll be no longer any electricity going through to a pump and boiler and they'll, they'll switch off. There should be a slight overrun on the on the pump and the reason for that is, is to allow for, uh, for it to take any ex extra sort of heat out the boiler and that's actually one of the reasons why we should fit uh, a bypass because it could cause damage to the pump. If the pump's trying to pump and this heating valve is, is closed then um, that's obviously an issue. So it must have a, it's got a capacitor fitted in it which ensures it pumps, continues to pump for a little while even after it's no longer got any electricity flowing to it because it's kind of saved some up um, and that takes the extra heat out of the boiler and yeah and we need to make sure we've got a bypass fitted after this pump before this motorised valve to, to prevent damage to the pump. Auto bypass valve takes us on to this nicely, um, fitted just after the pump before the motorised valve. Essentially it works like a pressure relief valve. So if, if this uh, is, is sort of continuing to pump like it like it should be for, for a brief um, amount of time after it's no longer there's no longer a call for heat to take the extra heat out of the, the boiler and this valve is, is shut then what can happen is what can flow through here through this bypass valve and um, into into the return to allow that water to circulate and, and this like I say it works just like a, a pressure relief valve. If this if, if we have these valves closed for example the water is trying to pump it's going to create an increase in pressure and it will cause the bypass valve to open and the water and then flow from the from the flow into the return. I take that extra excess heat out of the out of the heat exchanger in the boil. So the bypass helps prevent damage to the pump and the pump over room facility helps prevent damage to the boil. Frost that. Um, you may come across this if you ever sort of have to fit a system in a garage, an unheated area of the house or an attic possibly. Um, you'd fit a frost that and alongside a pipe stat okay the frost frost stat measures the temperature of the air and it will automatically cause the boiler to, to fire up when it starts to get cold in about five or six degrees normally um but and that's to help protect the the pipe work so it so it all doesn't freeze but this should also be fitted alongside a pipe stat and the pipe stat will measure the temperature of the water in the um, in the pipework, because obviously, the, if it's in an unheated area of the house, even if the boiler kicks kicks in, it's not actually going to heat up the area that it's fitted in. So potentially, you could end up heating up the whole house without. And these pipes are going to be roasting hot. The whole house is going to be roasting hot. But the frost that's still going to be sensing that it's cold. So you, you should fit it alongside a pipe stat which measures the temperature in the pipes um, and they will switch the system off uh, normally when the pipes reach a temperature of about 28, 26 degrees I think. 
Okay, so you can see the system here, fully pumped system with a boiler interlock. We can see a flow coming off here with a pump, bypass valve there, motorised valve here. Uh, room start, cylinder start, programmer for, for time control, all coming into a wiring centre, connecting up, connecting everything up. So firstly, for example, we'd have the the switch in the programmer would need to be open to allow the electricity to flow through to, for example, the room start. That room start would be set, not depending on, on where in the house, say, for example, at 21 degrees. So unless the, if the temperature is, is cooler than 21, for example, if it's 18 degrees, then the electricity would be allowed to flow back through again to a motorised valve, that would cause the motorised valve to open, which would flick a micro switch, which would then allow the electricity to flow through to the pump and the boiler. And that's that's a boiler interlock essentially. Oh, now it is time for your task.